Welcome to A State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by author and DJ Dave Haslam. We're in Manchester, Dave, spiritual home? Oh yeah, spirit. I mean I've been in Manchester um, 42 years, uh, having grown up in Birmingham. So yeah, Manchester's my home and you know, it's where my family have all grown up, so... You know, when uh, I look at your story and how in your younger years you were curious about books and music and something drew you to Manchester, was it the culture, the music, the the vibe of the city? Um, yeah, it was primarily, I think, the music. I mean, I was, uh, I, I, I was yeah, yeah, the kind of teenager who was very curious. I think curiosity is one of the things that, I've, that has stayed with me through the years. Um, and I also didn't ever really trust the the story we were being given about anything, you know. And and I was very bored by a Saturday night TV and bored generally. So I would, in yeah, in a curious way, go out looking for something out there that you know was was better or different, more exciting than what was right in front of me. So, um, yeah, I used to hang out in record shops. They always seemed to me be, to be the kind of place where, you know, stuff happened and people gravitated towards, you know, and I'd go to um, jumble sales, you know, yeah. I'd, I'd kind of go. I, I remember, uh, you know, if I saw somebody who was dressed in a kind of weird, punky way, I'd, 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 I would on occasions kind of follow them to see where they went, you know. And... Um, and I did. Th I think my world, yeah, revolved around music and books as a teenager. Um, I mean, I did go through a bit of a phase of thinking that I was going to be the next Kafka, you know, or the next Albert Camus. Uh, and um, but being involved in music and being interested in music was just, you know, much easier in a way, a much more obvious and in your face. And I mean, in my teenage years in Birmingham, I, you know, I was lucky and I was able to see uh, a lot of great music mm. uh, in the venues around Birmingham. Some of it made, you know, the prefects who became the Nightingales, the Au Pairs, early Dex's Midnight Runners. I saw them, Steel Pulse, UB40. There was a lot of stuff around. But um, part of my adventuring into what else was available I'd buy the NME because, again, it seemed like a doorway into something that was, you know, really interesting. And, I mean, it kind of made me want to move to New York, to be honest, but that wasn't feasible. So all the stuff about Buzzcocks, Joy Division, The Fall, Magazine, I mean, I, I loved all them. So that was one of the great attractions of Manchester was to be in the same city as those bands. And actually, when I moved up, I thought to myself that, you know, um, in my head, Pete Shelley, Marky e. Smith, they were like absolute heroes, mm. legends, icons. And I thought they would arrive and they'd be carried through the streets on a sedan chair with people throwing flowers in their path, you know. Uh, and I came up and they were, it wasn't like that. The seat that that scene, which is now very talked about and mythologized, it was very small. Mm -hmm. In Manchester, and uh, you know, I'd see Pete Shelley in the bookshop, and I'd see Marky e. Smith, obviously, in the pub, and it, um, yeah, so it it was it was available, and and I, it was easy enough to kind of through the fanzine that I started to be a part of all that mm. because it was like I say, it was small, it was very open minded, and uh, there was no barrier to entry. So, uh, it, you know, um, that, that music was just the thing that was driving me and, and, and music was the thing that, yeah, I, my, my first kind of steps into the world as an independent person was um, through involvement in, in the local music scene. You're talking about a barrier, there's no barrier. But I've heard you speaking about a quote from Kevin Rowland of the Dexies talking about just jumping the barrier. Yeah. If, if there's one there, jump it. Um, how important has he been to you? Is he an inspiration to you? Oh, he was a very, very much an inspiration. Um, I, uh, that, that particular quote, I remember uh, reading uh, Dex early interviews with, with Kevin and Dexies. And Kevin was, uh, you, you know, quite a, not a difficult character, but the journalists would come up from London and go and meet Kevin in Birmingham. 
And, and, and Kevin's never been one to just give the media sound bites and obvious stuff. And, uh, and, and yeah, he talked about, um, you know, jumping the barrier at New Street Station and going down to London. And there was something about that image of that band doing that that stayed with me. And, and I thought, um, yeah, jump, jump the barrier. And, and the, other, the other analogy I use is, is knock on the door. Mm-hmm. You know, if a door isn't, if, 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 you know, if you don't think there's a door there, just just knock on the door or build your own door, you know. And um, I think I was partly in that attitude, partly inspired by other people, but partly it was the times that I'm talking about, the end of the 70s, early 80s, that notion that you could participate in music particularly, but in other stuff as well, um, I think that was very strong, that do-it-yourself thing, that thing about not waiting for someone's permission, mm-hmm. particularly when it comes to creativity, but just crack on and, uh, you know, say what you want to say, do what you want to do. Um, that does sound like a lyric. I don't know who it's by. Um, but that um, that spirit of the times, was, together with my natural curiosity, was just kind of pushing me on, I think. You mentioned fanzine culture, the NME. Uh, I'd probably throw in John Peel as well, and how important these three elements were to music fans and to bands. Mm. And you know, there may be people tuning in where these things don't exist anymore. And you were at the forefront because you ran a fanzine debris, mm. yeah. and that gave you access to some of the bands that um, obviously you were interested in and, and switched you on and turned you on. Yeah. But how important were these three elements back then? Well, they were really they were really important. I mean, uh, Peel. I mean, when I wrote my uh, autobiography, Sonic You Slept on My Floor, it wasn't in order to kind of assert how special I am, you know, or what an amazing life I'd had. Partly it was to pay homage to people like John Peel mm-hmm. and, and Tony Wilson, people who um, saw uh, the power of allowing and helping and opening a door or, or just encouraging people. And, and, and they were... I mean, they were both very important. Uh, fanzine culture for me was also about self-expression. I mean, my fanzine debris, I, rem- I remember it was it was about music, but it was also about other things. So, you you know, I, I'd, a fanzine, I'd go and sell it at a gig, you know, uh, and or at the queue outside a gig if I didn't have a ticket for the gig. And um, I remember, you know, I'd sell... The most I ever sold was one night the Associates played the Hacienda. Um, and I'd sell them at Orange Juice gigs and the Smiths and Susie and the Banshees, birthday party, you know. And my diary would be full of all these little selling opportunities. Um, but for me, it was um, about sharing my ideas and my passions. So some of it was music. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people would kind of scan the contents and they'd maybe see, you know, interview with Sonic Youth or whatever. But I'd kind of slip in a little kind of mini essay on Tarkovsky, the Russian film director, or, you know, uh, urban terrorism in, in New York in the 60s. or and um, But it was very much a reflection of all the stuff I was interested in and I wanted to share. But the other thing about fanzine culture was it connected you to that readership. Mm-hmm. So there were people who would buy the fanzine who then I'd keep seeing them and it was part of a community and then you'd swap a fanzine. Um, you know, so fanzine writers in Scotland or, you know, Newcastle would, you know. Set, and In fact, um, Chris McDonald in Newcastle would send me early copies of Viz when Viz comic came out and I'd send him Debris. So I think it was... That culture, if people aren't um, familiar with it, was, number one, it was about finding how to get information that wasn't readily available, that wasn't obvious, how to get that. And it was through certain radio stations, fanzines, any kind of alternative culture. Um, And it was also about sharing. And, you know, in the same way that now sometimes, you know, in social media, I think the best thing about social media is when people share a video of a new band yeah. or they just read a book or they've heard an event's coming up. And that's kind of really what was happening 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but without all that technology and very much kind of, you know, um, word of mouth, you know, hand to hand. Yeah. Um, and, oh yeah, well, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, obviously at the time when you're young, you know, you're not aware of, of what it all means. It's only afterwards that you begin to kind of analyze, analyze what happened. But it, it was certainly very, um, it, it yeah it molded it kind of molded my worldview in a lot of ways and I think a lot of the stuff that I do now is still about just sharing a story or an idea or a bit of music or or something um, and the other thing about that period was that nobody in that alternative world once you'd stepped away from the commercial Saturday night TV thing there was no expectation you would become famous or you become a millionaire you you were already doing something that was about uh love and about ideas mm -hmm. and so your decisions you were making about what you were going to do what you're going to put in a fanzine or what records i was going to play when i started djing none of them were about what's going to help me become more famous what's going to make this more commercially successful the decision was always based on some kind of... In fact, it was almost the opposite of that. I mean, uh, none of the DJs in the Hacienda uh, that I know and that I ever heard ever played Blue Monday by mm. New Order because it was kind of too obvious. You know, have a, I mean, it would fill the dance floor, I guess, if we'd played it, but we didn't. And that kind of decision-making is very much a part of... of, of you know what I still am, what I still do, um, and it's a bit kind of contrary, uh, but um, it, 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 partly for me because I just also I can't I can't fake it. I mean, you know, if I'm not interested in something, I'm not interested yeah, in it. Yeah, you're, you're talking about um, taking a direction not based on the money and the adulation. Well, very interestingly, the first book I read was Life After Dark, which I absolutely loved, and you spoke about the kind of backgrounded DJs where they weren't as revered as they are these days, uh, where they're called parasites in some areas of the press. Mm. Uh, DJs were killing live music. So it's not something in the kind of early to mid eighties that you would think that's the place for me to go. It's not as though you would aspire because you think you're going to get money. What was the background to DJs in this opposition to them? Well, when, when, when I started out uh, DJing um, in the early eighties, I mean, most of the most people who are interested in alternative music and and stuff outside of the mainstream uh, were were interested in live music. Mm -hmm. um, you know the bands the bands that were coming through. Partly because at the end of the seventies there were so many great bands coming through. You know, nineteen seventy seven was meant to be you know the, the the year where more bands were formed in Britain than any other year before or since. So. Um, so the DJs were, I mean, there was radio DJs like Peel and Steve Barker on Radio Lancashire, but um, uh, there were DJs on the Northern Soul scene. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there were reggae sound systems. Uh, on the Modern Soul scene, there were a few DJs that people would follow. But in that kind of alternative world that I was in, uh, when you said DJ, you thought of those dodgy characters who were introducing Top of the Pops every Thursday. And you know, our, our probably our our instinctive dislike of them has since been obviously, uh, yeah, we all understand why we thought that back then. But then, you know, so when I started out DJing, I didn't really have any role models, um, and uh, but uh, as you say, there was this campaign, uh, Keep Music Live, mm -hmm. which was uh, the Musicians Union had started it in the seventies. Um, when disco uh, first became a thing. Um, and it was, I mean, it, they were a trade union and that their point was to try and uh, make the, the musicians who were part of that trade union wanted work. You know, I mean, what happened in the Hacienda was exactly, you know, in the mid-80s, mid they had to stop putting on bands because they were losing money putting on bands. Yeah. And started employing DJs. And um, it was... I don't think it was really a cultural thing as much as an economic thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was 40 quid.
for a Thursday and 80 on a Saturday. And um, and if you'd put a band on, I don't know how much it would have cost. So, uh, you know, the Musicians' Union were kind of right that people were booking DJs because bands were too expensive. And they, wa they wanted their membership to keep getting those gigs. But um, what, obviously for me, what was great about DJ culture is the way that DJs can introduce new music mm -hmm. to people. And that is ultimately... It, it everyone wins uh i mean i, I mean I, I obviously everyone looks back at the hacienda and they all have their reasons for thinking it was you know a remarkable place but the best thing for me was that when people came up to speak to me they would invariably be asking what was that record you just played uh, you know, I hate now being in a club where people just bug you all the time. Will you play this record? They play it on the radio. Will you play this record? You know, this DJ plays it. Um, and they're requesting records. Whereas at the Hacienda, they come up and say, what, what was that record? So that ability to find a place in, in the four or five hours of DJing that you've got, find, find a place to play an unfamiliar record and turn people onto it was a complete raison d'etre of what we were doing. And you know you only you only really get that in a, in in a DJ experience. Um, you know you go and see a band, they play the hits. You know it's on the album, it's readily available. Uh, whereas DJs can feed that into the culture. Mm -hmm. You know the the famous story of a guy called Gerald going to the Hacienda and hearing all this music from Detroit and Chicago played by the DJs. And going home and trying to reproduce it on relatively primitive equipment to make his version of what he was hearing and you know coming up with voodoo ray on cassette which he then gave to one of the djs and he'd started playing it you know so that record would not have existed if it wasn't for that club and um you know that 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 that, for me, that's just that's fantastic. It tells you everything about the value of a DJ. Definitely. You're, you're talking about the Hacienda, and there's other examples where people from all different areas gravitate mm. towards one area because there's that shared ideology, the shared taste in music. And we were talking about tribes earlier yeah. and how it can't be regionalised. You can find you know members of your tribe anywhere. And I think none more so than a nightclub. You, know, mm. you think of Wigan Casino and the people that went there to celebrate this scene, yeah. the Northern Soul scene. But they were travelling down from Scotland, they were travelling from everywhere to, to go there and, yeah. and be part of this tribe. When you went to the Hacienda, it developed, didn't it? It wasn't like that straight off the bat. What was it like if you were to describe the Hacienda when you first went as a DJ? Um, well, it was such a big place uh, and it was a kind of stripped-down warehouse, the design of it. So it was very different to the kind of clubs that people were used to. Um, you know, the usual kind of sticky carpet mm -hmm. type uh, club. And if you were on the, if you were kind of alternative at all, whether you were into kind of funk and hip hop or whether you're into kind of weirdo John Peel type music, you'd be also used to smaller places, you mm -hmm. know. So suddenly in this kind of vast uh, warehouse space. Um, but People would turn out for the gigs, but then, you know, that, that that was what was expected. It was just a gig venue, you know. So, you know, I mentioned the birthday party, the associates. People would turn out for that, and you'd see the tribe, you know, the Nick Cave lookalikes all there at the birthday party gig. But uh, what happened with the Hacienda was because it was such a big space, as DJs, I think, we had to find ways of drawing people in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I was very much... Person. I mean, we never really talked about any of this, but for me, I thought, well, the only way I'm going to get a thousand people in here is to not just play one style of music. I mean, I'm talking about the kind of mid '80s, you know. So that it, I, I was eclectic, but partly because I had a quite an eclectic taste, but also because I thought, well, the 200 people from that club and the 200 people from that club and from that club, if I can bring them all together, then we've got a chance of filling this 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 space. Um, and then, it, because it was resident-based, by, by that I mean it was resident DJs mm -hmm. every, you know, we all had a particular night that we did. 
It also meant you could build a community. So people would come every Thursday or every Friday. And they'd get to know each other. And, um, and yeah, and, and also because we were very creative in the way that we were programming music and because it was owned by Factory and New Order and obviously they've got a lot of artistic credibility. People also that were drawn in were people who were, some of them anyway, were into uh, uh, maybe forming a band, you know. And I, I sometimes say that, you know, on a good night at the Hacienda, you might go there and find the rest of the band you always wanted to be in, plus your manager, plus the guy who was going to make your video, plus the journalist who was going to write the best article on you in early in your career, plus the person who was going to start the backlash, mm -hmm. all in one <laughs> night, because that was the kind of yeah. audience, you know, and your stylist. So, um, but yeah, I mean, in, in Life After Dark, that book that you mentioned, I mean, one of the things that I say in that is, um, I think there's a phrase, the best club in the world is the one that changed your life. And so what I'm talking about there is that, although I was lucky enough to be a participant in the Hacienda story, that's just a very intense example of something that happens, I think, in towns and cities throughout Britain where a certain club for a certain generation in a certain era just seems to be the place people gravitate towards and then subsequently becomes a catalyst for other activity. Mm -hmm. um, in a way that I still don't think that mainstream media and politicians quite understand that power. Um, but I think people who go to clubs do. You know, the people who can look back maybe in their lives and think that particular club was the club where I my music taste was formed, where I met people who became my best friends yeah. and still are my best friends. And I felt at home. Um, and, you know, because again, the be you know, the best clubs are those where wh whatever your background is, you feel welcome, you feel a part of. Definitely. Now, you're speaking there about, you know, the people within the Hacienda, you could probably form your entire um, career around the, the talent that was in that room. Uh, you're wearing a Buzzcocks uh, t-shirt there. It's interesting when a couple of members of what became the Buzzcocks are at a Sex Pistols gig in 76. Mm. And you can look at other examples of that, like Oasis being at, members of Oasis being at Spike Island. And, yeah. you know, and it's the passing of the baton. But you mentioned Kevin Rowland and he's seen Gino Washington, I think, in 1968. Yeah. And I read a story about how Gino Washington then bumps into Ian Brown at a party. Tells him you need to be a front man. Yeah. Liam Gallagher watches Ian Brown on a stage, so it just keeps continues to go on. But that fusion of culture, fashion, music, uh, within the Hacienda, um, but it's not manufactured, is it, Dave? No. I mean I mean I'm quite happy to talk to you about the Hacienda forever. But like like I say, I also think it is it's a part of a way of thinking and a way of life that is in lots of towns and mm -hmm. cities mm -hmm. where um, creative people uh, go out on a limb to do something a bit different and 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 people gravitate towards that and understand that some people do it's always a minority but that doesn't matter you know and um, and something happens as, as a result of that and the baton is passed on from generation to generation and I think I mean from my own point of view uh, as somebody who's connected to the Hacienda is that I, I kind of feel like you definitely should get to a point in your life, later in your life, where your focus is less on kind of milking your connections to your past and more on using your past to kind of help create futures for mm -hmm. other people. You know, the legacy of, because it is about passing on the battle, you know, bec because it's only really subsequently that I've realised, I mean, Tony Wilson was a child of the 60s, you know, so he, he he was a good ten years older than any of us. Peel, like similarly, you know, and so we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we did without them. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like if you you need to get to a point in your life where it, it is really all about empowering the next people and passing on that baton. And then as a kind of as a as a as a writer and a historian, I I like the. I like making those connections so that when people read one of my books, it's not 
a dead history I'm writing about, but it's something that actually seems very relevant and relatable mm -hmm. um, in in the now. And um, it's not something that kind of belongs pigeonholed away in the past. Um, so I think that how our individual cultural political past can be used to help shape our future is really, really important. Um, and I sometimes think one of the reasons why history is not really taught or it's taught in a very partial way in our schools is because history is a great tool for changing the future. Yeah. And uh, But w we never get taught the kind of history that can really help us do that. I'm going to bring Cressa into the story at this point because in reading your book uh, on Stephen Cressa, you realise how much of a face he was around about the Hacienda at that time. Um, what was your first uh, memory of seeing this this guy, who then later became famous as being the fifth Stone Rose? Well, uh, I, I mean, I remember seeing him at the Hacienda, but also at other little places where, you know, our little crews would gather. Um, I mean, you know, I said earlier about a rec record shops being the kind of places I'd hang out. But, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of people, clothes shops, boutiques were the kind of place I might hang out. At. And, and every, again, every town and city's got maybe one a generation where it's, oh, I used to go there and I used to see that person. And and, and anyway, so Cressa, I remember seeing in uh, probably 84, 85, and we'd maybe be at the same gigs. And then uh, uh, he, he was... Uh, chasing a young woman who was a colleague of mine when I did a bit of part-time work in a boutique uh, called Identity. And so I'd kind of see him hanging around, um, hoping to get lucky with Tina. And um, But we talked about music a lot. Um, and I'd just started writing in the NME. And he, he, he used to um, occasionally, you know, he'd, he'd read what I wrote and he'd, we discussed that mm -hmm. so you know we connected on that level um and then uh, and then when the roses were breaking i started djing with them so you know their gigs at the hacienda blackpool ali pali spike island and obviously he was there at the same time backstage and then on stage um i mean at blackpool we were practically stood next to each other uh, on stage as i kind of i was djing and the band came on and and um, Cressa came on because he was next to John's amps doing all the guitar effects. And, um, and, and I was kind of stuck. I couldn't get off the stage. And so, so I, I, I was able to watch the, the Blackpool gig from kind of the stage. And that was, that was incredible. Oh, what a moment. I mean, the Roses were a phenomenon, uh, my favourite band of all time. And we've spoken about this fusion of their influences, psychedelia, punk, um, funk, all these uh, different inspirations and influences merging into one of the finest debut mm. albums of all time. Mm. When did you meet them and were asked to do their DJ sets prior to these massive gigs you've just mentioned? I, I don't really remember how I, I, I met, met them all, to be honest. I mean, um, I think I, I gave them one of their first decent reviews in the NME. Because the weird thing about the Stone Roses was there was a lot of resistance to them early mm. on in their career. And I think um, the NME were very sniffy about them, partly because they had had a, they'd had they gone through an early phase of being a bit punky. Um, I mean, they were never naff, but, you know, they, they weren't a cool band, let's say, uh, early on in their career. Um, and, and then I, I think in 87, I gave them a half decent live review. And I think that was probably, you know, they were carrying that round probably uh, at least for a week or two. So, um, th yeah, they knew I, I, I was becoming a bit, a bit of a fan. And um, Ian and John, I remember, used to come to the Hacienda quite a lot on the Thursday night I used to do. And they were into the same sort of bands, Jesus and Mary Chain, for example. Yeah, so I just kind of got to know them. And when, when they started getting big, they also began this that that attitude that they had where they were the best band in the world, mm. okay? And it was like... Um, uh, and it was, in a way, it was the beginning of that Manchester swagger that kind of Liam, Liam and Noel sort of took on to another level in some ways. Um, and it was a swagger that... 
Buzzcocks and Magazine and Joy Division had never had. So the Stone Roses were kind of really important in that kind of thing, just the way that you walk down the street, you know. Um, as I always say, you know, Ian would walk down the street like he was an away supporter going to a football match. There's a certain way that you walk that is like, the, you know, these streets are our streets. And um, so they didn't want a band to support them. Um, uh, they certainly didn't want to support a band. So uh, offering that the warm-up to DJs was what they wanted to do. And there was a guy called Dave Booth. He did a very psychedelic night in town. Uh, and me and him were the, were the DJs that played through most of those gigs. And uh, Oak and Fall came on board as well. Yeah, so that yeah, that's how that all developed. Um, and, I mean... It, we had a few conversations with Ian about about the music, but not many. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for them, it was just that they'd also been to clubs, you know, and that, that demarcation between live music and clubs, that was breaking down. So they liked, they wanted some of that atmosphere that were at the best clubs, that kind of euphoria. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of it being like maybe some of the, indie bands that were around where you'd go and see the gig and before the band come come on you'd maybe you know sit cross-legged on the floor drinking cider while the sound engineer played a dire straight cd and then the band would get up and you'd stand up and you know the gig would happen but they didn't want that they wanted you know a dj like me to kind of literally just at the moment they came on stage the crowd were just absolutely ready to be taken on to you know a cosmic journey and that was that was kind of basically Ian's instructions to me <laughs> when you think of Spike Island I'm obviously doing it retrospectively too young to go unfortunately and reading all the reviews and and the nostalgia that surrounds that and how important that was at that time for all of the Stone Roses tribe to come together and at that point they're wearing the flares the bucket hats that Rennie wore what's your memories of the day though Dave uh, well, it was it was an it was an okay good day. I mean, one of the things that did I remember thinking was that we weren't really used to watching music in the open air. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the 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 rock festivals at Reading and Castle Donington and places like this, we we'd kind of go and run a million miles from. You know, we were all kind of like yeah, warehouses and basements, and this is where real music happens. So to be kind of uh, on this kind of massive field in the middle of an industrial state it felt a bit weird um i mean i enjoyed it i mean i, I can't uh, 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 i wasn't taking it all in you know necessarily i mean that was one of the things i mean this isn't what you you asked me but one of the strange things for me about that era is how we weren't taking photographs yeah and we weren't making notes and we weren't keeping flyers you know, someone said, you know, what if someone said to me, we should have done, you know, what's your biggest regret in life? Sometimes I'm a bit kind of flippant and I say, I just wish I'd kept all the flyers at the Hacienda, you know, instead of writing my phone number and giving them to girls or whatever, you know, uh, because if I had, I'd have a wonderful collection and I'd be able to sell some on eBay. But we weren't, it was always about next week, especially as a DJ, mm -hmm. it was always about finding records to play so that next week is even better. And with the Roses, it was like, right, there's the Hacienda, Blackpool, Ali Pali, Spike Island, what's next? You know, it, it, so it wasn't about, we need to remember this moment. It felt like it, this was just the journey we were all on. Yeah. And um, it was all about kind of waking up the next day and, and just doing something that made you feel glad to be alive. Um, so... So I wasn't really, yeah, I wasn't really take, taking it all in. I remember, I mean, I mean, I enjoyed playing the music. I always do. I think I, I got paid two hundred and fifty pounds for an hour, which was by far the most money that anyone had given me to DJ up to that point. And I know that's a bit mundane. 
and mercenary of me, but that that's it, in my diary. That's the only thing that is mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> when you you said what's next, obviously we know what happened to the, the Stone Roses. Do you think they should have had an eye on the American market? I know they didn't ever seem that bothered to go over and break America, as it were. But they were they were writing music that could have translated at that point. Fool's Gold, for example. Yeah. The crossover tunes. Honestly, I don't. I mean, honestly, I don't know the kind of what ifs. I mean, at the same time, Happy Mondays were kind of falling apart as well and and I'd been very connected with them um uh, uh one of my business partners was their manager well he was my mate as well was their manager I DJ'd a lot with them as well and obviously they were part of the factory family same as the Hacienda um so it did kind of crumble away the Hacienda closed temporarily at the beginning of 1991 so it very much did feel like you know the en end of an era and in some ways that was good because it gave everyone like a kick up the backside. It was like, okay, well, you're wrong. It, you, you know, it, 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 it's not, a, you know, the journey you're on isn't predictable and isn't it's not there on a plate for you, you know. So everyone in a way had to start again. You know, I went to a different club, started running my own nights there, a club called The Boardwalk. Um, and obviously then what happened in Manchester is Oasis turn up and mm -hmm. basically you know, and do a kind of Stone Roses Mark II and, you know, the rest is history. When when you talk about the Mondays, obviously we've had some sad news about Paul Ryder's passing. Mm. Um, did you ever see back then a day where Sean and Bez are TV personalities? They have become that Saturday night TV that you didn't want to be associated with. I know, and well, it, uh, yeah, and, and Bez dancing on ice and all. <laughs> I mean, it, it, th theirs is a incredible story because again back in the 80s I don't think you would have picked them out not just not to be Saturday night TV stars but not even to kind of you know have a hit record or make or, or have a career um, I mean it's remarkable that they have uh, in some ways you know they I think musically they were uh, uh, probably took a few more risks than the Roses did I mean, I remember certainly early in their careers, you know, the the it, they were unpigeonholable, mm -hmm. which was fantastic. It's kind of why I like I loved them. And live, they were always like teetering on the edge of completely falling apart, which again I really liked. They were like whatever the opposite of slick is, they were that. So, um, but I actually, I actually think looking back that that was an important part of them and 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 who they were. Uh, and you know, and sometimes, it, uh, and the lesson that I kind of take from that is that, you know, you at a particular time when you're particularly when you're starting out, you might feel marginalised. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you're doing, whether you're doing, you know, a band or you're a DJ or you're a writer or spoken word uh, or artist of any kind, you might feel early on that you're marginalised. Um, but I, th I still believe that if you're making the, the decisions the way that I described it earlier, where you're making the decisions kind of from your heart and your instinct and your love of what you're doing, rather than chasing the dollars, actually, it can happen for you. And actually, chasing the dollars doesn't mean it will happen for you. So, you know, the fact that the, the Mondays were totally uncompromising in everything that they did, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I'm talking about literally... I mean, I mean, I remember interviewing them for the NME in 1986. Um, you know, they gave me a very, very hard time. They gave me like almost no quotes I could use, told me a load of lies, tried to get me high, you know. <laughs> um, and so that's nearly 40 years ago. Um, but but being un uncompromised is that was that was what's given them longevity, mm -hmm. and also authenticity. I think there's nothing there's nothing better than than, than seeing somebody who's created something and you really know it's authentic. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, the authenticity lends itself to the longevity. Yeah. Um, I look back, obviously, through um, a kind of like haze, a golden haze, all the good things that happened there. But there was a dark side as well, wasn't there, with the gun culture. Ecstasy people obviously know how important it was to the scene, but there was ecstasy deaths as well. Mm -hmm. So there was a darker side as well that you experienced. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I mean, you know, when I, in, in Sonic, you slept on my floor, I kind of try and reflect that. Um, 
I mean, I personally, you know, I had a gun pulled on me. I had somebody stubbed a cigarette on my forehead uh, in a club. Uh, I was DJing and I went to the toilet and someone just stepped out of the crowd and punched my two front teeth out. Um, I had uh, a couple of death threats. Uh, you know, and that, that was, that was most of that happened around the mid-90s mm-hmm. when things had really spiralled out of control in Manchester. Um, the Hacienda was going through a lot of difficulties. I was at the boardwalk and it was a constant struggle uh, against that dark, those darker elements. Um, as you say, there were ecstasy deaths. But there, were, there was, I, I mean, Manchester was pretty unhinged anyway. Um, you know, I mean, you know, uh, music and 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 drugs like ecstasy, they can't, you know, they can't change the fundamentals of a city, you know. And fundamentally, you know, m- you know, Manchester, like so many other cities, is a tough place, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of lawlessness, um, and you know, a lot, and, and and those elements kind of killed off a lot of the stuff that was going on, I think. Um, but yeah, we just had to kind of ride through it. I mean, there was noth- noth- nothing else we could do. Uh, I mean, I, I I always used to think that the music I was playing, you know, was for the ninety nine point nine percent of people who appreciated it, mm-hmm. and you know, uh, and, and and that was the thing. But um, I mean, you talked about the Cressa book earlier, and I mean the the Cressa story. Uh, which I tell in in the book, is a reflection of that, uh, what happened in the 90s particularly, uh, uh, um, um, in, on that scene and then afterwards. Because, um, as, as you know, because you've read the book, you know, Cressa, 15 years ago, um, w- w- started getting involved in heroin, addicted to heroin, and that, that led to him becoming homeless. Mm-hmm. Um so his, I mean, he's getting his life back together and the book is, you know, I started writing the book at that time when he's back on track. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it tells, it's telling a story which is very three-dimensional, you know, and part of the reason I wanted to do it was Cress is my pal, but also <clears throat> I think he's kind of um, emblematic of a lot of people who struggle, yeah. you know, and people who latch on to music and it becomes an important part of their life. Sometimes that is because stuff's going on in their life which is problematic for them. Mm-hmm. And music for them is is the thing they hang on to. You know, my friend Morrissey, rubber ring, you know, the rubber ring that you hold on to to stop yourself from going under. And um, But at the same time, you know, you can't isolate yourself from the real world. So... The the Cressa book also for me is a kind of way of saying, you know, there's there's another side to the story, particularly the Manchester story, which is always painted as being, you know, all this stuff happened in the 70s and the 80s and, you know, and now the city is kind of a world city. I mean, we all know about the way that cities are marketed and I think we're all a little bit cynical about that. But, you know, Manchester... You know, look at all the apartments that have been built, you know, and look at this and look at our infrastructure and in fact, inward investment. And they've got all this stuff going on in their heads, marked in the city. And I just thought giving voice to somebody who spent 10 years uh, homeless, mm. uh, you know, we certainly don't hear enough from those people that we see, you know, begging outside venues or outside supermarkets with a little cup asking for a, a few quid the, the opportunity to give a voice to to Cressa in a way for me was a way of trying to give voice to the the pe- all those people that he represented mm-hmm. so he represents both a music lover but he also represents those people who who go under um uh, but obviously not to give away the end of the book <laughs> you know the fact that he managed to drag himself out of that and you know and and it and, and is in recovery and and all that i also thought that in this day and age we do need that positive message as well oh definitely i'm one of the roses fans dave that you refer to in the book is 
whatever happened to Cresser? Whenever you read a forum, a Stone Roses forum, that was the question. Mm. And being removed from that, coming from Scotland, I had no idea, I had no links to what had happened to him. So it was really sad, but obviously also uplifting to, to read that he's in recovery. Um, and I remember him saying that uh, the most generous fans were the Sleaford Mods fans, wasn't it? Yeah. And he made more money that day than ever when he was begging yeah. sides. Ham and egg, and he calls it. Ham and egg. Um, but I was pretty sad to hear that the Rosies had, I'm not saying they'd cut contact, but they certainly had lost contact. There was no support kind of network there for him when he was at his lowest. Yeah, I mean, I think that that when when I did did the interviews with him for the book, uh, yeah, he I could tell he was genuinely disappointed that um, he'd lost contact with uh, um, Ian and John. Uh, I think he felt that particularly that that um, you know once John had realised just how bad things were for uh, for Cressa. Uh, you know, in in terms of his drug addiction and his homelessness, um, kind of you know start replying to texts and calls, <clears throat> and I think Cressa found that at the time difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. I mean, now he's a lot more philosophical about it. Um, and uh, but again, in the book, I say, well, y y you know, well, in the interview, you know, I'm sat there talking to Cressa, you know, I said, well, to be honest, especially if you are a smackhead. What do you? What are your friends supposed to do? You know, I mean, there's lots of people in the situation who have friends and friends who were in that situation. Giving people money isn't necessarily going to help. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no happy ending in a way to that kind of, and and Cressa understood that. So in a way, I think he he had an understanding of why, not. Not necessarily the Stone Roses, but other old friends drifted out of his life, mm -hmm. because it's how do we deal with this? How do we deal with you know? It it it's not, in a way, it's not, it's not very it's certainly not a simple thing, to know. Um, I mean, what what Cressel went on to say was, actually, it, not necessarily money. It's just uh, feeling remembered. Yeah, that that is the important thing that there's feeling a bit of support, moral support and being remembered uh, is is really what he needed from his old friends. But he also says that, you know, obviously in the 80s, you know, the Roses were great. You know, I mean, John had given him his job on stage, sorting his guitar effects. He didn't need to. You know, in the 90s, I think, you know, Ian and John had helped out in various ways. Um, and also he, um, I know that, um, Manny and Cressa are still very close. So, you know, it's kind of like a bit of a mixed picture. And I think in the book, I try and reflect all, all sides of that really. Yeah. Um, but you know, talking to being around him now and seeing how positive Cressa is and remembering some of the times when I bumped into him, when he was out begging, mm -hmm. you know, and it would prey on my mind. You know, and then other times over that period, that 15 year period where he it was really bad for him. Um, you know, there were quite a few occasions where fr uh, mutual friends would get in contact. You know, no one's seen Cressa. You know, anyone know where he is? Mm. You know, and occasionally, uh, you know, people would get in a car and go and look at, look for him outside. You know, Asda in Hume, where he often begged and. You know, so there were people worrying about him, but not being able to find him. You know, his phone number would change. He wouldn't have a phone. He wouldn't have any money on his phone. So, you know, it was a, that was all a, it was all, all that was happening around him. You know, we were kind of, and if you if I bumped into him, obviously, you know, you'd be bothered about, yeah, bothered about it. But, um, but he, you know, he he now says that it is up to the individual person. Mm. You know, the, the, and, and actually there is help out there and support. I mean, it's, a lot of it has been cut back, you know, by, by government funding cuts. But there is there are people who will offer help to people both with problems with addiction and with homelessness. Um, and uh, he actually, you know, he was helped by a friend of his who was going through a similar situation. 
And I think the two of them just looked at each other and were like, right, we need to, we need to change this and we, we, let's do it together. So, you know, although it's an individual choice to pull yourself out, you do need to be able to access support and you do need to try and find at least, you know, a pal or somebody who to help support you. It's great that you bring that to light and also Chris's story to light. Mm. I've got to thank you as a Stone Roses fan. But I want to know a wee bit more about this Art Decade series as well, Dave, because I love it. Mm. I love the look of it, um, the length of the stories. Talk us through the concept and where we are at the moment with the six books and some of the other stories that you've told. Yeah, so the, pro the project is uh, six, so far, six small format books, um, small in size and... You know, they can be read in maybe two, three hours. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it it came about because I'd written Sonic You Slept on My Floor and uh, and that was the fifth book that I'd written that was a proper size. You mentioned Life After Dark. That's That was like five years' work, mm -hmm. you know, the book before Sonic You Slept on My Floor. So they're big projects. Uh, and, and I had... Uh, at the back of my mind, quite a few ideas for more books. And and then I thought, well, maybe there's a different way of presenting those ideas and they don't all require five years of work and end up like, you know, quite a thick volume. Maybe I can, in a way, a bit more, not like a fanzine, but a bit like a fanzine, get that idea out quicker. So a small format means I can write a book in six months. Mm -hmm. uh, it can come out a couple of months later relatively cheap a format that i think audiences like read, readers like because not everybody wants to buy a 150,000 word book for 20 quid they might want to buy a smaller book for seven that's like a, the analogy for me is singles and albums you know for, for me these are they're like singles oh, yeah, and, yeah. and my my ambition for them is to be like ever falling in love with someone that you shouldn't have because that record, that single in two and a half minutes says more about love and lust and unrequited and trauma and everything than 99.9% .9 of all albums released any month of the year. So, so that is my, that's my kind of analogy. Uh, and they are also very much, uh, yeah, they look great. That I'm trying to get a little bit of that, I think, reflecting what uh, some of the great record labels like Factory and 4AD have done, where mm -hmm. you know it, it it just feels and looks good, um, and uh, the product is good. Uh, you know, it's not available digitally. You know, um, and uh, you have to buy the actual physical thing. So. Uh, and that also they're stories that haven't been told. Yeah. Because that's really, you know, I mean, I I don't say I have a busy life, but, you know, I have a busy-ish life with DJing, etc. cetera. And um, I may be thinking about it similar to my philosophy DJing. You know, if I was a DJ and I was just playing what everyone else played, then I'd probably still be making a living, but it would not be a very interesting life for me. And in the same way as if I was writing things that people already know and just kind of rehashing stuff, that for me that wouldn't be authentic, to use that word again. So, for example, one of the books is about Courtney Love, who lived in Liverpool when she was 17 in 1982. And obviously before Kurt, before Hole, before all that, she was there with a friend and it's about the six months that she spent in Liverpool, but how important that was to her yeah. subsequently. Mm -hmm. The Julian Cope said, um, carry yourself as if you're in a film of your life. And that's one of the things that she picked up was how to be a rock star because the Liverpool that she ended up in in 1982 was the Liverpool where you know, the NME would have on the front cover Ian McCulloch from The Bunny Men, Julian Cope from Teardrop Explodes, um, Pete Wiley from Wah, uh, Pete Burns, Dead or Alive, Dead or Alive were about to break, Frankie Goes to Hollywood about to break. Um, and so there were all, all, all this activity around 
in the city. Um, in fact, while she was in Liverpool, John Peel did a whole week of broadcasting from Liverpool, which is the only time when he ever got out of the London studio and did a residency somewhere else for a week because of the Liverpool scene being so strong. Yeah. So when she was there, um, her that was when she realised that that and 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 decided she was going to get involved in rock music because the people who were on the front of the NME were also walking up and down Bold Street in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. They were in the record shops that she was in. So it was, um, again, no barrier. It, it, it made her realise that it was achievable. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, research, the interesting thing for me was researching the book was how uh, much respect for Courtney I had by the end of the research. I mean, I had... I, obviously, I respected her before. I wouldn't have written a book otherwise. <coughs> but I, you know, I, um, I'm totally team Courtney by the end of it. Were you ever tempted to try and get an interview with her for the book? I like the style of doing it with the hearsay, yeah, without actually speaking to her. Were you ever tempted to do it? Yeah, yeah. As you say, the way that I've, I've written it is through the memories of people who remember her or claim to remember her being there, and I thought that was quite interesting because. That's uh, the idea of memory and mythology. Mm. Really, that in, in interests me, and um, I mean, in Liverpool's a very self-mythologizing city, and you know, the people who live there can tell a good story, and 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 that story could could be true or false. In a way, it doesn't really matter. Um, they still tell the story as well. Um, yeah, so I don't interview Courtney. I mean. I did find a couple of interviews where she very briefly mentioned being in Liverpool, always in a very positive way, um, apart from her relationship with Julie and Cope, which became very problematic. Mm. But, um, no, I just want... That's how I wanted to write it. Um, there's a friend of mine called Carol Morley who'd uh, written... who made a film called The Alcohol Years about her life in Manchester in the uh, first half of the 80s. And she goes back to when came back to Manchester at the end of the nineties and interviewed people who remembered her back then. So the story she doesn't really even appear on camera, um, and instead it's her life as remembered by all of us who remember her being lovable but annoying, and <laughs> and uh, I I love that idea. Um, I mean, you know, obviously to be a little bit deep, we have to all realise that our notion of ourselves is sometimes very different to how we're perceived. And I kind of quite, I'm quite intrigued by that generally. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued about how we judge people often on perceptions of them and um, and how do we navigate through that, that we're also... You know, our life story isn't always ours um, because it's dependent on, on, on other people's attitudes to us and, their, as I say, their perceptions. So I, so anyway, the Court, Courtney, that's the background to the Courtney Love book. But then Courtney read the book. Right. Um, in fact, Alan McGee uh, is a mutual friend of, of Courtney's and I, and, and through Alan, uh, I... I Connected with Courtney, right? Sent her the book, and um, she's declared me to be a genius. So that's a happy ending. Fantastic. And that is one perception of me that I will one hundred percent agree with. <laughs> Take that one to the grave, Dave. <laughs> Listen, it's been fantastic talking about some of your memories, not mm. all of them. Check out the books. Uh, we'll have some links underneath the video as well. Great, Dave Haslam. Thank you for joining us on a state of mind. Thank you so much.